When we're considering consent to an investigation or procedure, we need to consider the ability of the individual patient to deal with the issues which they're going to need to consider in coming to a decision. And this is where we meet the Mental Capacity Act 2007, which is really to help us in situations where we have an adult who has a diminished ability to undertake this sort of reasoning. If I bring out a few points from this, firstly, all adults are assumed to have capacity in the first instance. So we always assume someone has capacity unless they're shown not to by a capacity test, which I'll come to in a few moments. When we're assessing someone's capacity, we do need to make sure that we've done all that we can to help the individual to demonstrate capacity. So that might be, for example, using family members to explain things in ways that that patient might understand, using pictures, using translation, anything which will help that person to be able to make a decision for themselves. Then comes the situation if, despite all of this, the person doesn't have capacity and fails a capacity test, what should we do? Well, the guidance is that we should follow the best interests consideration. So we should think what would be in the best interests of this individual. So we should do what a reasonable body of clinicians would think is the best thing, particularly whatever is necessary to save life or limb. There are a number of situations in which confidentiality needs to be broken under the law, under a whole series of laws covering a number of things. For example, notifiable diseases. So anyone with an infectious disease, we have a obligation to tell the relevant authorities about that. It's usually the local authority, local government, whether the person likes us to do that or not. We just have to do it. There's various information about driving offences, for example, which are notified. Generally speaking, doctors won't be involved in that. It'll be administrative staff, but there's an obligation for information to be shared to identify the driver in the case of an accident when somebody has been injured, for example. We might specifically be required by a court to break confidentiality in a particular situation where there's information needed by a court. We are also under an obligation to break confidentiality if we come across information which we believe may prevent an act of terrorism or help in the arrest of someone being involved in terrorism. And there's also other information, for example, on children, local governments collect information about children coming to hospital and things like that. There are a number of different legal situations under which confidentiality needs to be broken. So that's legal requirements. The main focus for us in emergency medicine is on the diagnosis of harmful drinking. So what does the guideline say about this? Well, it says here in the first paragraph that all staff working for the NHS should be competent in identifying harmful drinking. And in the third paragraph, it recommends a specific tool to use, and this is called AUDIT, which stands for Alcohol Use Disorders Identification Test. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about a short form of the audit test in a few moments. Moving on to do not attempt resuscitation or do not attempt CPR orders. So these are orders that are made by clinicians, by doctors, when a patient is in hospital who's in a very advanced state of disease and that is not expected to survive, where it's thought that attempting CPR is pointless. And so this is specifically for the context in which cardiac or respiratory arrest is part of the dying process. And if I just explain that another way, the whole process of CPR and defibrillation, etc., was really created to deal with VF arrests, VF cardiac arrests. It was really because we know that patients with acute coronary syndromes, for example, and some hypoxic patients, if resuscitated, couldn't go on to have a lengthy period of good health. Now, this is not true in people who are close to death from a disease from which they are dying, in which case there really isn't any point doing CPR. That doesn't mean that CPR might not be successful, but there's no real point because the patient's dying and is going to die soon anyway. I'm going to show one of these forms in a moment, and you'll see at the bottom of the form that it's usually best if more than one clinician signs the form and that there's usually a junior clinician and a more senior clinician involved as well. 